Welcome to Stories, an Institute podcast, where we interview amazing seminary and institute teachers about stories found in the scriptures, discuss life challenges, and highlight amazing young adults who love the Lord Jesus Christ and His Church. I'm your host, Steve Livingston. All right, welcome everybody to our uh, next episode of the Stories Podcast. I'm uh, here with uh, Thordeson. We call him Thor. He's awesome. And uh, Jim Thordeson, he's the uh, Institute Director in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And uh, I'm just really looking forward to, to talking with the dame. How are you doing, Jim? It's good to have you. It's good to be here, Steve. <laughs> he's looking at me like, this is weird. <laughs> you guys were talking across the table. So, but... Um, Anyway, we're going to be in Matthew 25 today, but before we get into the story that we're going to talk about with the parable of the talents, I wanted to talk to Jim a little bit about his uh, his life and his family, and um, tell us a little bit about how you got into to seminaries and institutes. How'd that happen? You want the long version or the short version? Whatever you want to give me, my friend. <laughs> so, Well, I graduated from college, and there was no work in Detroit, Michigan, so I Moved to Utah to live with Grandma. I didn't know you were in Detroit, Michigan. Okay, yeah. keep going. All right. And I was teaching gospel doctrine in my young single adult ward. And a seminary teacher came up to me and said I should teach seminary, but I'd already graduated from college. Oh, really? So uh, I said, I can't go back to school. I've had enough of school. <laughs> and uh, long story short, uh, I taught one day at West Jordan Seminary. And they decided to hire me. Biggest mistake they ever made, I guess. <laughs> really? Only one day? I only taught one day. At West Jordan? At West Jordan. I was at West Jordan for a while, but you were there a long time before I got there. So yeah. Very good. I'm old. You're not that old. <laughs> so that's how that happened. I was single at the time. So I had uh, a lot of things against me to stay hired by the church. But luckily, a few years later, I met my wife at the Hale Center Theater. We were in a show together called I Came to Your Wedding. I Came to Your Wedding. Were you the actual couple? We were. We oh, had wow. the leads. Okay, we, we had the leads. We were practicing our wedding kiss in rehearsal. <laughs> it's a tough and, life, right? Uh, you get to practice life, your kissing yes. when you... Uh... So we decided to go through with it. And oh, wow. now we have four wonderful children and two wonderful grandchildren. And You don't have anybody at home right now, though, been, right? Do you, do you still have Yes, yeah, so my youngest is still at home. She's 13. Okay, very good. And what's her name? Dagny. Dagny. Yes. Where do you come up with Dagny? Where did that name come from? Dagny, we're, my heritage is partially from Scandinavia. It's a Scandinavian name. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. And the rest of your kids are just spread out all over the place? Uh, yep, spread out all over. One in Utah, and uh, the other two are uh, on their way to Tennessee. My second son is uh, has been approved to attend medical school. At Lincoln Memorial. Oh, that's cool. And uh, my daughter's going to go up there and live with him while he's going to school. I wow. don't know how exciting that'll be, but. So you'll be, he's going to be uh, moving to Atlanta over the summer and going to be uh, teaching at uh, the Institute of Georgia Tech. And uh, so you'll be a little bit closer, right? To, yeah. To family. Is your sweetheart excited about that? You got family coming in? Everybody's a little bit closer? Uh, yeah, I think she's excited about it. It's going to be an adventure. My 13-year-old, when we told her we were moving, yeah. the next day she said in our family prayer that she was excited to go on this adventure. So yeah. moving for a 13-year-old, it could be worse. Yeah, it could be so, a lot worse. You know, she could be having a, me a mental breakdown by having to move at that age, sure. right? But She's uh, awesome, though. But she handled it okay then, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, talk to me a little bit about what you have learned about raising a family in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, well, uh, probably the biggest thing I've learned is that the Lord is in charge in the details. Uh, not all of my children are, uh, have remained faithful at this point in their lives. They're not keeping their covenants the way I think their Heavenly Father would like them to. Um, but he's in charge. It's his great plan of happiness. And uh, I see his hand in their lives, even though currently they're not choosing to be faithful. 
to the degree that we would hope that they would. I don't know if that makes sense. No, I I, I haven't. You know, my sons are still pretty young, and they're still working through decisions that they make, and we work through those things with them. But uh, there's been no, like, I'm not going to church anymore or anything else like that. But I, several of uh, my colleagues, you know, that our seminaries and institute coordinators out here in the U.S. Southeast that have family members who are are struggling in, in relationship to the gospel and keeping their covenants. And, and I've been kind of blown away at the individual revelation that's been received by each one of these men. As they've worked through their, their own thoughts and feelings about um, what's happening with their children, and and I, I'm sure the emotions that that come with that. But I haven't obviously. I don't know those things. I mean, I've had roller coasters in other parts of my life, right? Yeah. But um, but not in that particular area. Other than instances where my you know uh, my sons have made some difficult choices, and I've had to kind of work through that idea. And I don't think I've done a very good job at it, to be honest with you. I, I, you know, at, at those points, I'm kind of just struggling and they want to go talk to mom because dad's struggling, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But uh, so what kind of advice do you give to, to people who have had that same experience? What, what would you say to somebody who came to you and said, how do I work through this? Yeah. Um, probably the most poignant message that the Lord saw fit in his mercy to share with me was when a parent has a child who is not making righteous choices, your prayer is that the atonement of the Savior would work in their life and that they would return and and come back into the fold and recognize the Savior as, as who he really is. And in those moments, if you're not careful, you focus all of your energy on on your child and forget to allow the atonement to work on you as a parent. Um, and so probably that's the greatest takeaway of all of this. And it was poignant one evening, very clear, uh, after many sleepless nights and, and uh, you know, you get ulcers and all kinds of things when the kids that you love aren't doing what you would hope they would do. And was very clear that the message was let the atonement work on you just as much as you want it to work on them. And that was life changing for me because you can't last physically very long, not sleeping and having an ulcer and everything on your mind all the time. And, and you got other children and a spouse that you need to take care of and those kinds of things. You have to allow the atonement to work in your own life. And when I decided, when I made that conscious decision, everything changed, which is probably why in the beginning I said, he's in charge. They're just as much his children as they are ours, more so. And uh, now it's, it's, uh, there's a lot less stress because I can just ask him what he wants me to do with his kids. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And uh, if I'm worthy and I'm pure, he'll tell me. And uh, then I don't have to second guess what I'm doing as a parent. So what came into my mind as you were talking was that verse about peace I, live, peace I leave unto you, uh, peace I give to you, not as the world giveth. What, what, what does that verse, if anything, mean to you now in relationship to letting the atonement work for you? Well, I, I'd probably be lying if I told you that I have ultimate peace all the time now. That's not true. Sure. Um, certainly every day still, you know, has its challenges and its trials. Uh, but the peace does come. The peace absolutely comes. I have a testimony of that. And the peace is that he is in charge. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you when you were talking, and it's something that's been on my mind personally because of President Nelson's talk about, he he was very clear in his talk about how we need to be better, that purity through repentance is what we should be working for. It should be an integral part of our lives. And I'm thinking about purity in relationship to power, and, and you, you had said, if I, if I keep myself pure, what have, you, what have you learned about that in this whole process? Well, very clearly, Section 121. Okay. Uh, that conduit, that the powers of heaven are directly connected with the righteousness of Heavenly Father's children. 
And if you want to tap into that power, you have to be pure and righteous to do that. I also think uh, when you go to the temple, the writing on the wall is holiness unto the Lord, house of the Lord. And uh, when you're pure and you're holy, you enter into his house and he communes with you there. I have a testimony of that. It is his house. I got a, last night I had a, I, I was at an event with my son and I won't share what that event was other than the fact that there was a lot of, a um, lot of bad decisions that have been made by individuals on display. Can I put it that way without revealing too much? Sure. Um, I went home a little, I guess, upset because I don't live in that world. You know, my world is institute and being the bishop and I'm working with my sons. I'm at home and and I don't often, I'm not involved in events that would put me in a place where there's a lot around me that, that is not wholesome, I guess if I can put it that way. And I wondered when I got home, I'm like, man, my son is in this environment eight hours a day, if not longer, especially with academic activities. And, and to be honest with you, I'm like, I don't even have a clue how he survives. I, I, I. It was so upsetting to me to to see what was going on in this environment and and I really went home kind of a little upset, not just at the world that we live in and and my wife was like, "Steve, you can't control the world and I'm like, I, I know that's not what I'm saying, but i but it 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 got me thinking more about President Nelson's admonition to create a, 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 a what a, your home being a center of learning. And then also uh, your home being a sanctuary of faith and how significant those two invitations really are because of the environment that we're, we're in today. And yeah, I, I think of the word remodel. He's used that a, a few times. Which is a strong word. That's, that's tearing down word. and I've, building, right? That's, I like to, to build things and sometimes I like to remodel things, particularly homes. And uh, in reference to that quote, where we need to remodel our homes to be centers of learning, you, you and I as parents and those parents who might be listening or future parents, you have control over that. Uh, and it is a remodel, particularly with what the, Lord, what the world is doing in our day. We have to constantly say, do I need to tear this wall down and put this wall up? Or do I need to install this security system or or these cameras to keep track of what's going on. In a, I'm speaking in a symbolic sense, obviously, but it, it is a remodel. And when you realize in those days like you had yesterday, that's the world your son is in, it really should hammer home to all of us that the home is becoming a real crucial place of peace, like we talked about, and learning and spirit and love. Um, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes whole sense. And um, it, it also tells me that there has to be a intentional. I don't think you can just sit back and hope that it happens or love what the prophets and apostles are teaching and not take action. I, I was talking to you about it being intentional about what we do and specifically with the our scripture, our story today, which is more or less a, a parable, the parable of the talents, right? And this idea um, at the beginning of this parable where he's, you had mentioned uh, this idea of why, uh, maybe we could just start a discussion there about um, why did the Lord maybe use, so we're in the um, verse, moving on down here, oh, Verse 18, is that where we're at? There we go. Let's, let's, uh, no, we're in, uh, 14. We're starting in 14. And, um, for the kingdom of heaven is a man traveling into a far country, uh, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. Love that language. But verse 15 says, he gave unto, uh, and unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. And to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Now, you had asked me an interesting question about the idea of why three men. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I enjoyed our discussion about that. I don't I just had that thought. I, what if the Lord only used two servants instead of three? 
what do, what messages do we lose if there's only five talents and one talent? And I think there's a powerful message in the fact that there are three because the five and the two, um, they both double what they were given and they both receive the same reward. Despite the fact that one has made a lot more, the reward is the same. Come and live with me. Let's let's be together. And I think you miss that if there's if there's only two, because then the one can say, Well, of course he did better. He had five and he he was, you know, somehow he, he must special. be better, right? Yeah. I well, I only got one measly talent in it. The Lord doesn't care. He so, just wants you to make a difference. So, so that was the language you talked about making a difference. Yeah, there's a great quote. Um let's see if I can it's by Stanley G. Ellis in conference October 2006. And uh, I don't want you to think that I'm some kind of a scholar. Let me just give the audience here a, a, uh, a shout out. He's about ready to lie to you just now, so don't listen. No, to I'm you. not. <laughs> a shout out for an app called the Citation Index. Oh, very good. Yeah, that's true. This is great. Um, when you asked me to sit down and talk with you about Matthew 25, one of the first things I do as a student of the scriptures is I want to know what the brethren have said about those verses. So you always go look for the, where they spent I, the most time on the verses, right? I yeah. always go yeah, I do the exact to the citation thing. index. And this is where I found this quote from, from Elder Ellis. He quotes Matthew 25, and then he speaks about this last servant that only had one that went and hid his money instead of taking it to the bank or, or improving on it. He says this, this seemed to be a harsh reaction to one who seemed to be trying to take care of what he was given. Obviously, he's thrown into outer darkness <laughs> and his, everything that he had, which was only one, was given to somebody else. But the Spirit taught me this truth, says Elder Ellis. The Lord expects a difference. I knew in that moment that each of us will one day stand before God and give an accounting of our priesthood service and stewardships, which I think also applies to the sisters. Did we make a difference? In my case, was the Houston, Texas North Stake better when I was released than when I was called? Thankfully, the Lord teaches us how to be fruitful, how to make a difference. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. John 15, 5. If we exercise his priesthood in his way, following the direction that we receive from his servants and his spirit, we will be good and faithful servants. Uh, to me, that's a powerful message. Do I make a difference with what the Lord gives me? Um, which kind of brings a discussion on when and why and how does the Lord give me things? Hmm. And what comes to my mind with that are spiritual gifts. So I was going to head there next because... Um, Brother Thorson here has recently even changed my life in, in, because of some of the study that he's done about uh, learning and how to learn deeply, and particularly in relationship to the, the doctrine of Christ and what a significant impact it should have on our lives as we, we strive to, to live it. And so at one end, we do have spiritual gifts in the character of Christ. But there's a, quite a bit that comes before that. So could you take some time, and, and this will take a little bit, but I really do want everybody to hear this because I think this is really significant, this idea, because I think we need to get engaged in this process. And, and I were, use the word engaged on purpose because from the beginning of the doctrine of Christ to the end, there's some significant choices that need to be made if we are going to allow the blessings of the atonement to come into our lives. So would you jump into that and talk to us a little bit? Because you've spent a great deal of time studying about learning deeply and, and jumping into the doctrine of Christ and, and why we need to learn deeply in the doctrine of Christ. That's the language Elder Clark keeps using with this, right? Sure. Uh, if you'll open your scriptures with me, Steve, and maybe I can ask you some questions and we can kind of discuss this together. All right. So this is let's go to Second Nephi 31. Okay, let's do that. And uh, certainly this is Nephi, and he's talking to his family, and particularly his brothers. We're going to find out a little bit later. He's going to ask him some questions. Okay, so what verse do you want me to start in? Verse 2. Okay. 
he just kind of lays out what he's going to do. Do you want to read verse 2? Yep. Wherefore, the things which I have written sufficeth me, save it be a few words, which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. Wherefore, I speak unto you plainly, according to the plainness of my prophesying. Okay, so he's going to just spell it out clear how it is. What is the doctrine of Christ? And uh, I'll tell you, more than anything else in the scriptures, I've tried to want to understand what the doctrine of Christ really is. Um, and 2 Nephi 31 gives us a really plain, clear, concise pathway of what that doctrine of Christ is. And without taking too much time, I'm sure some of you have studied this before, but I invite the listeners, you can never read 2 Nephi 31 and 32 enough, even into 2 Nephi 33. Those are chapters that you should memorize for that matter. They're just so powerful in what, what he's talking about. So, so Steve, uh, obviously the first thing he starts talking about with the doctrine of Christ is baptism. Um, if your son was here, could he quote to me the fourth article of faith? Yeah, definitely. Okay, how does it go? Can you remind us? We believe in the, fir in the that the first four principles and <laughs> ordinances of the gospel are first, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, second, repentance, third, baptism by immersion, fourth, I want to say confirmation, but it's not. <laughs> I'm slaughtering this right now. So fourth, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost the by the laid out of hands. Apparently the, the podcast the stories Ghost. is to figure out if, if institute should, directors if can, do the of the can, can do the articles of faith. Okay. So there you go. Yeah, so we have faith, repentance, baptism, and then the gift of the, the Holy Ghost. Of the Holy Ghost. Yep. Now, when I teach this to my students, I say, now, those are the first principles and ordinances of the gospel. Is that all of them? What are the second principles and ordinances of the gospel? And almost instinctively, everyone will say, well, it's faith, repentance, baptism, uh, gift of the Holy Ghost, endure, endure to, to the, the end. end right? they, yeah. they just they jump, jump right to that. To and I guess, I don't know why, uh, maybe they've never read 2 Nephi 32. And I was reading through this, studying the first principles and orders of the gospel and how baptism fits with faith and repentance and the gift of the Holy Ghost. And clearly, Nephi teaches us that uh, there's a gate. What's the gate as, as described in 2 Nephi 31? Do you remember? So the gate is repentance. I, I think that's what it says in 15. Does not say the gate in 15 or one of those verses down there? Um, it's not, it's, it's not actually repeating. both, repentance and baptism in verse 17. Okay, very good. Okay? So you repent, you change the direction you're headed, you come unto Christ, you change, and you go through this gate, which is the baptism. So, so it is both, right? It says and baptism. Yeah. Very good. Okay. And then in verse 18, it says, then you're in the straight and narrow path. Right? Yep. Now, for time's sake, let's just jump to 2 Nephi 32. Okay. After he's taught the doctrine of Christ, you get verse 1 that says, Now behold, my beloved brethren, I suppose that you ponder somewhat in your hearts concerning that which you should do after ye have entered in by the way. So they've gone through the gate, repentance and baptism. Faith's a given, or they wouldn't have repented. So what happens once they get in the way? And he's perceiving that his brethren are confused. So almost as if they're thinking like it's an event. It's a one-time thing, right? I've done right. that. I'm I've done on, the gate. I'm right? done. I'm good from here on in. Yep. But there's a path that's the gate opens to. True. Sure. And that pathway involves some things. And it says, but behold, why do you ponder these things in your hearts? And then this interesting phrase that I pondered over because I was trying to be a good student of Nephi. And he says this, do you not remember that I said unto you, that after he had received the Holy Ghost, so let's pause there. So that's the first principles and orders of the gospel. Faith, repentance, baptism, gift of the Holy Ghost. Then he says this line, ye could speak with the tongue of angels. And now how could you speak with the tongue of angels save it were by the Holy Ghost? Angels speak by the power of the Holy Ghost, wherefore they speak the words of Christ. Wherefore I said unto you, feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what you should do. And as I pondered over that, I thought, 
aha, we get baptized after we've repented, we get the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then we enter him by the way, and he wants us to speak like we were angels. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why would he want us to do that? And why would he want us to say the words of Christ? Because that's what the next verse says. Angels only speak the words of Christ. Why would he want us to, once we're in that pathway, speak only the words of Christ? In fact, he wants us to eat Christ's words like we're feasting on them. He wants us to fill our whole body with his words so that we can speak them in this pathway that we're in. Why? What's the intent? What's the purpose? Well, for me, the intent is that we might, well, I think it's twofold, and, and, and maybe you can add or, or correct what I'm about ready to say, but I think it's twofold. I think the intent is you and I need to become a disciple of Christ through this process, but then we need to help others become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I think that's the intent, right, for their profit. Um, second, which is kind of the other outcome that comes from helping others become disciples of Jesus Christ through um, the Holy Ghost or through the gifts of the Spirit is that we gain the character of Christ through through doing that. And, and I think that's why I think this is super important that we feast, but then we go and we act. It'll tell you all things what you should do. And I think it's when you do those things, then then the blessings of the atonement, we change. We, we change, but also in the process, we can help others come to the Savior and get on the path, right? You got it, Steve. So if I'm speaking like an angel, and I, I just, we call it angel talk with my students. Which is fun. It's a lot That's fun. just kind of a little phrase we made up. Talk like an angel. Um, when you didn't have any faith and you wanted faith, somewhere you heard an angel talker and it gave you enough faith to repent to the point where you immersed yourself in the gospel and started to keep ordinances and covenants, be they baptism or the sacrament or the temple or whatever. So you can see how this is circular in its in its design. Once you're baptized and you have the gift of the Holy Ghost, now the Holy Ghost allows you to ask for gifts. In this particular case, the gift of speaking like an angel, the gift of tongues, which is really the gift of saying the words of Christ in whatever language you need to, whether it's English or Spanish or sign language or whatever. Yeah. And you speak those things to come around to find people that you love who need more faith. You see how that becomes circular? Yeah, and, and not to interrupt the dialogue here, but I mean, just last week, I remember having an overwhelming feeling and going to the missionaries and saying, I need to go with you to an appointment. They're like, who? And I'm like, I don't know. I just feel impressed. I need to go with you to an appointment. We went to that appointment. They invited me to go to, to, to meet this. Uh, I won't share her name because she hasn't given me permission to do that. But we went to the appointment with her. We were reading a story in the Book of Mormon. And through that story, some words stuck out to me as the bishop. And we went to the section of the Book of Mormon where those words were deliver and burdens we went to look at Alma's story. As soon as we did that, this investigator, this individual who was studying about the church, opened up her heart and began to share everything that has been a burden to her and how she felt like she needed to be delivered. And, and, and of course, um, at that moment, what I was able to do with a bishop, which only a bishop can do, was able to offer her some help and some things in her life that, that couldn't have happened any other way. And she had hope. She She had this hope. And so... Um, today, she's having her interview for baptism, by the way, which awesome. is really cool. Yeah. Um, so she's heading down that that path. But but that doesn't happen without, um, well, in my mind, not not about me, but, but a, a clear prompting and a, a following that prompting, but then a discernment while you're teaching a lesson and then allowing the Holy Ghost to really be the teacher, right? To share what the yeah. Lord wants you to share. And then the Holy Ghost being able to testify to the to her. So, just an example of my mind recently that just really happened just last week. Sure. So, yeah. awesome. So, thanks for sharing that. Um, but go to verse four, and maybe this can then we can maybe conclude this thought with 
how it applies to Matthew 25. Uh, you want to read verse 4? Okay, so we're in 32, correct? Correct. Wherefore, now, after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. Okay, so this verse kind of, at first I was like, what is, why is he all of a sudden talking about asking and knocking? Yeah, I want you to talk to me a little bit about that right there. Sure. I've probably blown past that and gone straight to five. I don't know how many times. Yeah, so here's what I, here's what I feel like maybe might be going on at this juncture here. So they don't know what to do once they get in the way. And Nephi says, well, there's a gift waiting for you in the way. And the gift is the gift of tongues to be able to speak like an angel. If you don't know that there's a gift in the way, it's because you didn't ask. Hmm. Okay. Now, the most, probably the most influential scripture in all of scripture, according to Elder McConkie, is James 1.5. Sure. If any of you lack... Wisdom. Now, is wisdom a gift? I think so. Absolutely it is. It's in the list in all of the different places for gifts of yeah. the Spirit. Wisdom is one of them. So if I just add, if any of you lack the gift of wisdom or the gift of blank fill in the blank let him ask of god that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him but let him ask in faith so what i discern from this in the doctrine of christ is once we enter in the way nephi says your job now is to ask for gifts now do we ask for those gifts to self-aggrandize or to make ourselves awesome? No. We ask for those gifts to bless those that we love to get more faith so that they can enter in on the path. Now, you mentioned this earlier, but this is where it's totally awesome because spiritual gifts, if it's a math equation, spiritual gifts equals Christ-like attributes. And so as we ask for spiritual gifts to bless the lives of others to help them get more faith, it actually changes us, and we become more like Christ. Well, what I like in verse 4 that I hadn't seen before was, neither do you knock. Well, we know that when we see the Savior, you know, in, in Moroni chapter 7, verse 40, it says, we will see him because we will be like him. There's this real clear covenant relationship of someday knocking at the door of the celestial kingdom and if we're like him then he will let us, in, let us in right yeah. right he'll open unto you which which I, I love that language because it really is clear that the atonement then comes in and and, and gives you his character yeah the character of christ and so by the time we get to six he says that's the doctrine of christ drop the mic <laughs> that's it so we have faith we repent we get baptized and start into a covenant path. We get the Holy Ghost, and then we start asking for gifts. Now, that's a whole other podcast about those gifts, but why do we ask for them? To bless the lives of others. And while we're blessing the lives of others, asking for them, it changes who we are. And we can ask for as many as we want. He's waiting to give them to us. James 1, 5, if you'll just ask me for them, I'll give them to you. You can take those gifts and you can use them. Now, do you see how that fits in with Matthew 25? Well, I love that it fits in with Matthew par with the parable of the talents because I think that's what it's talking about. I think that you're given spiritual gifts and the Lord is saying, you had mentioned earlier, I know what you can do with them. Now go and double them, right? And in the middle of all that, it's always given for others. These spiritual gifts are given for the benefit of others. Yeah. And I think that that's in, intentional. We can't become like the Savior without focusing. Uh, what is the Elder Benner said? Turning from self to, to Savior, right? That yeah. idea of looking outside of yourself. I want to maybe just say one other thought, and then we can go wherever else you want to go. But sometimes I think young people think, when they, when they read the parable of the talents, I have a finite number of talents. I get five. And I got to do with whatever I can with those five. And, and I think what that does to us is it sets us up for failure. The Lord has an infinite number of gifts for you if you'll ask for them. Isn't this the, like, uh, what's his name, Elder Lawrence's uh, talk about the what Christmas tree? What lack I yet, yes. And the, the, all the gifts that are sitting under there and what about... It's another the, the great talk there. to yeah. read, yes. 
So. And, and it's interesting that everybody gets one gift, right? Yeah. It says yeah. that very clearly in section 46 which of the Doctrine and Covenants. Which is right Kings. with the, the story we're talking about. Which is crazy right with the one. story. Everybody, everybody gets, gets one. Everybody gets one. There are others that actually come with more. Um, obviously, I think because they developed them before they even came into this world, right? And, yeah. Uh, so, but at least one, right, for sure. And uh, yeah, I, I just what if what if the parable was changed where the the guy who got one uh, chased the, chased the the master down and said, "Can I please have forty more? <laughs> because I really want to." bless all these people with what you what you have to get to offer me wouldn't that change the parable totally yeah, bizarre but it'd be cool it would be cool be because cool. he would realize that's what the doctrine of christ is i think of uh it's so plain and so simple if i will just immerse myself within the gospel the holy ghost will come down and he'll bless me to be inspired to ask for what i need gift wise and I can be very, very specific. I don't have to say, give me the gift of, you know, knowledge, because sometimes that's how it's listed in, sure. in the list. I can be so specific as to say, give me the gift of using my time wisely to study out of the textbook that I'm studying in, in college so that I'll know exactly what's going to be on the test. Can I ask for that gift? Absolutely, you can. Because when you are inspired by the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost can teach you all things. I realized recently that uh, I've been I've been given an assignment at work to uh, work on uh, a new model that we're presenting to coordinators, and and with that assignment, I realized as I'm working with other people that they're a lot more talented in the relationship to order. Like they're very good at putting things in their proper order especially when it comes to presenting something to somebody so that they are willing to accept it. Sure. Um, and I, that is not my strength. And I was like, I feel very like a fish out of water. And so I remember I, I sat down and I'm like, I need to ask Heavenly Father that I can understand, just begin to understand what it means to put things in their proper order. Uh, and because I hadn't thought about it until I started watching people who are very good at it. That they're just naturally their gift is that they're just good at putting things in their proper order. They're good at explaining things to people in their proper order. And I'm like, I'm really good at talking about doctrines and principles or even following the prophet. But sure. like when it comes to order, I'm like, I, I kind of want to jump to the, I'm getting so excited about step 10 that I want to just jump to step 10 and versus mm -hmm. just staying at, you know, putting things right. in the order that they need to be. And so I, yeah, so, so let me call thing. you to repentance yeah, on you, what you just said. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, go ahead. Go for it. The one who has five and the one who has two, what's their reward? Oh, it's the same. It's the same. But you said, well, I don't put things in order very well, but some people naturally put things in order. What did you just do? Well, I kind of excluded myself from that process. Maybe I don't know, but uh, I, just, <laughs> I just and we're all guilty of it. Sure. But luckily, I don't think it was planned that you did that for me to point out. But it, we all do that. We all kind of look at the guy who has five and go, oh, yeah, I can never make as much as he does. I don't have, and yet that's not the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is: you ask for whatever you want, I will give it to you, as long as you're asking to bless somebody else that you love. And uh, what's what's neat is when you feel the Holy Ghost, you love everybody because the gifts of the Spirit are what's the first one? Love. Yeah. And so as soon as you start to feel love towards somebody else, then you want them to walk the path that you're walking, which is the path to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And oftentimes helping them means you've got to figure out what gift you need to help them. Because if you don't, yeah. then you... <sighs> So we're not enough. I can tell you that we're not enough to help every single person with all of the mirage and all the menagerie problems that we face in the world. So I'm sure there might be someone in the audience who maybe is preparing for a mission, or maybe on a mission, uh, and maybe your roommate in college or your roommate on your mission is driving you crazy, but you still love them. Yeah. Can you ask for spiritual gifts and be very specific on how to bless and love that person even more so that you can walk the same path together, especially as a missionary? Uh, it, it can become super powerful when we understand that basic, plain principle. 
which flows through everything, which is like the Savior says, this is, this is it, right? When he, he says the doctrine of Christ, right? This is what yep. we need to be focused on. So, um, all right. Love that in relationship to the parable of talents. I think it's absolutely wonderful. So I, I appreciate you sharing that today, Jim. Um, My pleasure. Uh, I Let's do the final five. Can we do the final five? I told you about this earlier. Okay. These are the final five questions I ask everybody. And uh, so I, uh, so just answer them. Um, long, short, doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do with them. Okay. Okay. All right. What is your favorite place to ponder and study? I don't really have one, Steve. I study when I feel prompted by the Holy Ghost, and I can be in a multitude of different places. Like in the car today when you were talking about thinking yeah, about this whole I, thing, right? I drove five and a half hours here, and it was a perfect place to study. But I can also study in my lazy chair at home or, or on the church pew. Yeah, I just love to study, and I love to take any opportunity that I can. But what, you're, what he's not telling you is that once he's done studying, he goes out and creates something out of it that uh, <laughs> that, that works for you. The first, you know, he'll create something. I wish I wish we had it is visually in front of you all the stuff that he goes through and and the multiple versions till he <laughs> till he comes up with something that really works. That's actually a, a huge, amazing thing to watch actually happen. So. Um, who is your favorite? See, I just did it. I've been trying not to do that, and I did it again. Do you hear me? You have to change. We're on the five. I know. Okay. Who is your favorite person to learn the gospel with? Um, to study the gospel with or learn the to gospel? To learn the gospel with. Well, of course, my wife. Okay. Because we are one, and uh, obviously, in the description of my family, uh, in the struggles and things that we go through. My wife and I have learned more deeply the atonement of the Savior than any other way. So clearly her. Who do I like to study the most with? We have, when Come Follow Me came out, we set up a family study group. And every Sunday, almost every Sunday, we Zoom conference with anyone in our extended family who's interested. And we study together. And sometimes it's an hour, and sometimes it's two hours. I love to study with my family. Uh, it's been an awesome experience, and come follow me with that. That's great. I, I love them. What is the biggest lesson you've learned this year? Uh, well, like you, I, I don't know if we talked about it, but I'm moving to Atlanta. Yep. And... Uh, I guess it's the same thing that I, I'm a witness of all of this. The Lord's hand is in my life. He's in the details. And um, it's awesome to be able to say to a realtor or to someone who's helping me with this process of moving across the country to look them in the eye and say, you know, it really doesn't matter. The Lord's in charge and he's going to do what he needs to do. And they kind of look at me and go, you're weird. <laughs> but, but I just know the Lord's hand is in my life. He's in the details. He's in the things that I say on a daily basis, the places my feet take me. He takes my feet there. Yeah, I love that. That's great. That's actually real. So what do you do at the end of each day? I sleep. <laughs> no nightly routine. <laughs> I was talking to Al Caraway. You know what she does every day? This, you know, the tattooed Mormon. She, she eats a bowl of cereal every night before she goes to bed. Really? Oh, yeah. She likes eating a bowl of cereal. Um, I don't know. It's probably different. Uh, I, I kind of have a habit of what I do in my prayer at night, and that is to ask the Lord to accept my offering. Hmm. I think that every day we have an opportunity to offer him us. We put ourselves on the altar. And sometimes I'm embarrassed to say, Heavenly Father, please accept my offering this day because I haven't offered him much. I've been self-centered, focused, and, and haven't thought much or done much for him. But I try and, I try and express that in every one of my prayers at the end of the day to accept my offering. And I learned that from a talk by Elder Ballard when he was a roommate with President Kimball in Canada. He knelt with President Kimball, and President Kimball said those words that the Lord would accept of his offering. And Elder Ballard said it changed his life. 
And when I heard that story, I said, I want to be like President Kimball. So I try and do the same. Yeah, something that um, at the end of my day um, is that idea that uh, asking Heavenly Father, this is where I write in a journal, which is to show me what I've, when your hand has been in my life today when I was too busy not to, I was too busy to see it. And I think that opens up a door for me to, to fill in my heart the very things that I that I need to remember. I need to remember and see his hand. But there are times when I'm so busy I'm not seeing it. But when looking looking back and letting the Holy Ghost fulfill his role in remembrance is is, is always good. Uh what's your number one or top advice about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Live the doctrine of Christ. You know this better than anyone. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think the doctrine of Christ encompasses everything the Lord wants us to do. Everything. Repentance, faith, immersing ourselves in the gospel, blessing the lives of others, becoming like the, like the Savior, and taking upon ourselves his characteristics. Uh, I, If it's plain enough for Nephi, it should be plain enough for us. Well, um, before we finish up, and I'd like you to if you're comfortable in sharing your testimony, I'd I want you to do that as we finish today. Before, because I'd like to end on that. And uh, but uh, before we do that, I just want to. Sorry, I I am deeply grateful that you're my friend, and and that I get to associate with you, and uh, because uh, I, I've learned a lot things that I've seen the hand of the Lord put me out here in Tallahassee, Florida. And I've had some really amazing experiences, but really tough experiences. But along the way, Heavenly Father's put people into my life that I don't, I don't know where, I, you don't know what you're missing until he puts these people into your life. And then you begin to learn from them. And you can't really grow and become like him unless they're there. And you're one of those people for me. And I love you. I really do. So, Thank you, um, Steve. Will you will you finish up with bearing your testimony and then and we'll we'll call it a day. I certainly will. I'd love to. My testimony recently has uh, taken the form of a similar testimony by one of our seventies named Elder Corbidge. Uh, a few months ago, he gave a BYU devotional in BYU Provo called "Stand Forever." I recommend to your audience, every single person should watch that devotional. You can access it on BYU Speeches. Um, I found that my testimony aligns with his, and so I share it in a very similar way that he does. I know that there is a God. I know it by my experience, all of my experience. Uh, I know it because there's evidence, and the evidence is amazing. I know it because I've studied about God. But most importantly, Steve, I know it because the Holy Ghost, a member of the Godhead, has borne witness to me that there is a, a loving Heavenly Father. I also know that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of that Father and was sent specifically to earth to redeem us from our sins and to overcome death so that we can live with our Father in heaven again. I know it by my experience. All of my experience points to that. I know it by the evidence that's there. And the evidence is amazing. I know it because I've studied the life of the Savior. But most importantly, I know it because the Holy Ghost has borne witness to me that he is the Christ. I, I add this footnote in case some days my children hear this. Um, it is very hard to be a covenant keeper if you don't believe in Christ. It is also extremely difficult to believe in a prophet if you don't know that a prophet is a witness of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes prophets in a worldly sense, say some pretty bizarre things. But if the evidence and the experience and the study that Jesus is the Christ is ample and sufficient, then it's a lot easier to follow a prophet 
And so I would invite them and your audience to focus on the Savior. Uh, I also know that the kingdom of God is on the earth today and is led by a prophet. I know it by experience, Steve. I know it by all my experience. The evidence is sufficient for me, and the evidence is ample. I've studied about the kingdom of God on the earth, and this is his kingdom, restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. But more importantly than that, the Holy Ghost has borne witness to me that his kingdom is on the earth again today. And I share that testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.